Um, I had the good fortune of when she figured that out, by introducing myself, my name is Tyler Abel. Um, I had the good fortune of knowing uh, President Johnson uh, for some time and working for him in a few different capacities as a campaign uh, office gopher in 1960, uh, uh, advance man in 1960, um, and thereafter as advance man and uh, assistant uh, postmaster general and chief of protocol. Um, I didn't have as much interaction with him personally as my wife did because she was around the house all the time. Uh, but one of the interesting things is, to me, what an impression he made. Uh, every interaction that I think I ever had with him, I still have a pretty vivid recollection of. And although a lot of people tell stories about how he had temper tantrums and called them names and that sort of thing, I don't ever remember having that experience. A couple of arguments with him, uh, but uh, I didn't argue with him unless I knew I was on sound ground, and uh, I think he respected that. Uh, I had the good fortune in my life to work for, or know, uh, some of the most uh, prominent and fascinating people uh, in America at that time. My stepfather was a famous journalist, Drew Pearson, and he had uh, a closer relationship with Lyndon Johnson than most other journalists. And uh, as he said, uh, both in his diaries and to friends, uh, Johnson was the first president that he ever knew that he was on a first name basis with. Um, my father-in-law uh, was one of the strongest and most uh, dynamic, forceful politicians that I met in my long career of meeting politicians, uh, Earl Clements, who was um, a close colleague of, of President Johnson's uh, when they were in the Senate together. He worked, in fact, as Johnson's uh, assistant uh, majority leader and was majority leader when the senator had his heart attack in 1955 or 56. Um, it was because of that that I remember my f very first association with Mr. Johnson when he was a majority leader and uh, he gave a wedding reception for Bess and myself. Um, and it was it was quite a uh, quite a reception. The uh, and all of the senators, I think almost all of them came. And uh, I was in the receiving line. Mr. Johnson was at the head of the receiving line, and I would look up uh, to see what was going on at the first part of the line. And the uh, different people coming in were many of them I knew and recognized, and having a wonderful time uh, meeting. Uh, Mr. Johnson and laughing with him and trading stories and jokes as they <clears throat> went from him to uh, Mrs. Johnson and down the line to Bess and myself and and Bess's parents. Um, but it was a um, it was something that stuck with me because uh, I realized that uh, President Johnson, then Senator Johnson knew so many people and was on such good terms with him. And, and uh, as I got to know him better uh, throughout his career, I realized that his interaction with people uh, was probably on a different level than uh, any of the other presidents that I knew or even any of the other really uh, top politicians that I knew. Uh, he worked more and had a better grasp of, of things and of people and was willing to talk with people in a way that uh, was just, you know, really remarkable. Uh, he was, uh, I 
some might say he was always on stage. I don't think it was a stage, but he he wanted to react with everybody. And uh, one story I remember vividly is when he appointed me assistant postmaster general. He called me on the radio. I was down at the ranch, <coughs> and uh, where he asked me to come and visit. He was trying to keep it a secret that he was going to give me this job. And uh, uh, I, I can still remember the voice coming over the radio saying, Tyler, Tyler, where are you? And I said, well, I'm not far, Mr. President. I'm over here. And uh, Bess and I had gone over to uh, Fredericksburg. And uh, he said, well, I want to take you deer hunting now. Come on back here. So. 80 miles an hour down the road didn't take too long, but the voice came over again. Tyler, Tyler, where, where are you going? Where, where are you? And I said, Mr. President, I'm crossing the Pertinalis right now. I'll be right there. So I came into the, into the farmhouse, of, uh, the, the ranch house a few minutes later, and uh, he grabbed his hat and said, now, come on. And I got in the, uh, in the little uh, golf cart behind him, and uh, Paul Glenn was on the back of the cart, and I guess uh, one of the Secret Service agents. Um, and he turned, and I think maybe, I know that, that when we went deer hunting, A.W. Morrison, his good friend and neighbor, and Jack Blenny and I were, the, uh, were in the car with the driver. And, uh, but I can't remember who was on the golf cart, except I remember Paul Glenn was there, because I talked with him about it later. And he, uh, as he backed out of his little uh, shed where he parked the, the uh, golf cart, to, and he was going to drive over to where his Lincoln was parked, and we'd go deer hunting in the Lincoln, he said, uh, Tyler, I'm going to make you Assistant Postmaster General of Facilities. He said, that's a $4,000 increase in pay for you, and I want you to spend every penny of it on whiskey for me. And I said, well, I, thank you, Mr. President. That's wonderful. And absolutely, you know, where do you want it? <laughs> so uh, he said, somebody's already told you that, haven't they? And I lied to him and said, uh, you told me, Mr. President. And, uh, and he let it drop. Of course, he, he hated to have his secrets usurped by members of his staff. Uh, so uh, I didn't want to. Uh, admit that, that they had told me before he had, but it's hard to keep something like that a secret. Uh, then we went deer hunting, and we were out a couple of hours. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, as I reflect back on it, and I frequently do, it tells so much about him. Here he was out deer hunting with myself. I was certainly the, the uh, strangest of the group, but I certainly wasn't a stranger. Jack Valenti and A.W. were, you know, he'd known closely for years. And uh, throughout the time we were deer hunting, he was joking with us, telling us different things. But an awful lot of it was talking about, you know, what was going to happen next year. And he kept moaning about the fact that the budget was going to be over a hundred billion dollars. He says, I just can't keep it under a hundred billion. And uh, Jack Blunney said, well, Mr. President, that doesn't make any difference. Said, you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and, and people are going to understand that, so you're going to go over a hundred billion. You know, you shouldn't worry about it. And he would go on about other things in the budget, and uh, it was just remarkable. Here we were at, relaxing, deer hunting. Uh, he had some, uh, had a cooler with a ice and scotch and a couple of glasses and he and A.W. were having a little drink and he'd make me get out to open the gates. He said that Jack had hurt something and uh, you know we can't we can't make Jack be doing this extra work. Tyler said now you get out and open this gate and I said oh yes you know I was thrilled to have something constructive to do. And then the conversation would come back to the budget and uh, and this dreaded uh, nightmare of going over a hundred billion dollars. Well, he did come in at 98.6 uh, a few days later, which some people claim was the start of credibility gap. But I think it was just his uh, hard work and perseverance. Um, 
Another time, years later, I, uh, I don't know whether I was chief of protocol or whether I was over at the White House uh, during the brief period in which I, I was in, uh, in a private law firm. Uh, but he was having a group at his uh, upstairs in the oval room, oval room uh, at the the upstairs oval room at the uh, at the White House. Uh, beautiful, uh, lovely place, and and it was a small group. I doubt if there were more than uh, uh, thirty of us there, maybe less. We were having cocktails. And he was talking about how he was drinking uh, Diet uh, Pepsi or Diet Dr. Pepper or something like that. I said, I'm, he asked me how I kept so thin and I, you know, I didn't have any good excuse, just lucky. And um, then I got in a little conversation with, uh, with Kermit Gordon, who was then uh, head of the Bureau of the Budget. And Tom Mann, I don't remember what we were talking about, but the president was, was sort of close by. And this was just a, a friendly Sunday afternoon, uh, little uh, association of friends. Um, and Tom Mann, who I think then was assistant uh, secretary of state for Latin American affairs, had, had known the president through, as many of us had for, for many years, um, and I, I guess was originally from Texas. Uh, but he and Kirby Garden started talking about something that I didn't know much about, and I can't remember now what it was. It had something to do with oil. Uh, and they said, well, maybe this is a good time to tell the president about it and uh, ask him about it. So they did. The president was right there. They sort of yanked on his arm and said, uh, come on over here. We want to tell you about this, and they hadn't gotten two minutes worth into what they were trying to sell him on before he came back and said, you're wrong for this, 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 this reason. And it was just stunning to me on several levels. Um, and here's a man, you know, and he is you know, relaxing, trying to, you know, have a good time with his, with his friends. He never said anything about how, you know, we're not talking business. Not only that, he was ready to talk business. And the business that they brought up, they've been rehearsing and talking among themselves about for, you know, five or ten minutes before they decided to spring it on him. He'd been talking to somebody about, you know, whether they were overweight and, you know, laughing and, and uh, talking the way he did, kidding everybody. And he's ready to just sink them right down and they weren't properly prepared. And that was the end of that. I don't think that policy was ever reviewed anywhere ever again. End of, end of that policy. Um, the, uh, he was such a, had such a commanding presence. Everybody, everybody respected him. Anywhere you went. When I was uh, chief of protocol, one of our, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, that I did with him, as I guess every pro chief of protocol does with every president, uh, I accompanied, accompanied, to, accompanied him to uh, uh, embassies. And typically he would go to most of the embassy national days. Uh, of which there's, you know, what are there, 200 embassies, so, you know, some days there would be more than, more than one, and some days, luckily, there weren't any, and I guess he, he missed some. But uh, this, this was late in the administration, and Nixon had been elected, and we went out the, uh, out the door, just two of us, and the Secret Service, you know, was, was driving, uh, and there was, uh, he started to get into the limousine. And the Secret Service man uh, said, uh, Mr. President, your limousine is over here. This was Nixon's limousine. So he, you know, humbly you know, walked over and got in his limousine and off we went. And uh, 
at the embassies, the waiters knew him. And they knew what he wanted to drink, and they knew that he wanted a really, really, really light scotch. Uh, he preferred Cuddy Sark, but uh, if there was something else, you know, he tried to get J&B or something that would be as much like Cuddy Sark as possible. And if it, uh, if it did more than have just a flavor of, of scotch in it, he would uh, complain. And sometimes he, I think he complained anyway, just to be sure that nobody tried to be too liberal with the, with the scotch. In the, uh, but you know, I thought it was really interesting that the waiters at embassy cocktail parties would know that he wanted just a tiny little bit, and they, you know, I, I knew some of them too. And, and they knew me, and I'd say, now, you know, make sure. Oh, yes, yes, we know Mr. Abel, you know, just, a, just a tiny little bit. And they'd take it over to him in a silver tray, and he'd frequently just drink the whole thing down. But there wasn't enough scotch in there to make any difference. Uh, I only saw him over in Bible once. Uh, it was when he was in the Senate, and we were, uh, I was there visiting him in his majority leader office, which is right off the floor of the Senate. Um, so there was Senator Clements, who was then not in the Senate. He'd been defeated in 56, and this was 1960, in the, in the pre-convention uh, pre era, uh, just a, not too long before the convention, so it must have been June. Um, that was Senator Clement, Senator Humphrey, myself, and Senator Johnson. And I think that was all the people in the room. There may have, there might have been one other person in there, but I, I don't recall who it was. Um, and um, we sat and talked about the, the upcoming convention, the primaries. Humphrey, by this time, was uh, had either pulled out or was, uh, you know, he was had clearly been defeated, and uh, he laughed at uh, Senator Johnson and said, "Now, Lyndon, you know, how many votes do you really have?" And Senator Johnson went through the litany about, you know, well, we got some of this, we got some of this, and. Uh, we were all, I think, kidding ourselves into thinking that we really did have a chance against uh, Senator Kennedy. Um, and Humphrey called him on it and said, Now, Lyndon, I don't think you've got that many votes. Oh, well, they argued with it. Uh, they argued about it a little bit, but, uh, you know, needless to say, it didn't come to anything. But as the time went on, uh, I know he had, uh, you know, more and more scotches, and it was it was getting real late by the time we finally pulled out, and uh, he was clearly feeling the scotches, very clearly. And my father-in-law, who knew him, uh, you know, really well, they served in the Senate together, and I think it, well, they'd actually served in the House together, uh, way back in the, uh, see, because my father-in-law served in the House in 19. 40, and Johnson was in the House until 48. My father-in-law only served one term, and then he went back to Kentucky and ran for governor. But uh, anyway, he pulled me, the, the Senator Johnson got into his limousine and, the, and drove back home, and this must have been close to 11 o'clock. And uh, my father and I left, and I had a car, and we we drove back to. Uh, I was living in Alexandria. I don't know. I guess he was in a hotel. Anyway, he said, "You know, I've never never seen him really drunk before." Well, it's the one time. Um, he was just a uh, you know an incredible incredible human being, dedicated 
to what he was doing. And, you know, everybody has read about him. Uh, and, and I do it with, with, with great interest. Read several biographies. Um, and I try to see whether the early days that I didn't know him personally read true to the man that, uh, that I knew. And I think, uh, I think the stories about how he, how he got started and uh, how he was so interested in people and, and the way his personality shone through uh, is uh, very true to the man that, that I knew. And, uh, you know, any successful politician has to, has to be able to know people and to talk with them and to uh, recognize them. The, the masters are wonderful at remembering names, but I never met a good one that wasn't pretty good at that. Um, but he, I think he was just much, much better than any that I ever knew. Uh, and his ability to uh, to just talk with everything, with everybody about everything, and do that all while he was, you know, concentrating on being the president of all the people, um, or trying to be president of all the people. I thought was just just remarkable. Absolutely remarkable, uh, and a tireless campaigner. Gosh, uh, he just—he'd uh, complain sometimes, but not very much. Uh, when I was an advance man, uh, you know, he just kept going and kept going till early morning, till late at night. Uh, I remember my first trip with him. We—he came to. Uh, well, he, he was still Senator Johnson. He was on the ticket with JFK, and his first trip was to come to JFK's hometown, Boston. And Horace Busby wrote his speech, which was used uh, over and over and over again through the campaign. It's a long ways from Austin to Boston. That was the catch line. And uh, it was my first trip advancing anybody on anything. And I tried to do all the things I was supposed to do, and and uh, it it worked out very well. We got big crowds, and and uh, the thing that that uh, amazed me most about the trip is that he, or somebody, probably he personally, had come up with the idea of handing out passes to the uh, United States Senate as majority leader. He had these little passes as all congressmen. Senators, representatives had to tell you, you know, you're welcome to visit the Senate with his signature on it. And uh, I didn't know anything about this, but when we, uh, as we were driving from the airport, we came to a point where I had suggested that he might want to stop and greet the crowd, and I was, I had done everything I could to get the crowd out. Uh, and there were quite a few people along the street. It was pretty successful, but. He was just a master. Uh, he got out of the convertible and uh, started along the street, shaking hands and handing out these cards. Well, the people just, you know, there were some looking out the windows and they just all flocked down and came out and just filled up the street, made a beautiful picture in the paper. And he was just handing out cards. And I don't know, somebody, I guess, was deputized from, the, from his, uh, vehicle to come up with more cards because his pockets never emptied. He was just handing them out and shaking hands and, and going up and down the street. It was uh, uh, it was one of those things about him that, that I'll never forget. Another story that, uh, that I love about him, uh, it was Christmas of 1968, which was a, a dark day. Uh, you know, uh, that was close to the end. And my wife, Bess, had suggested to the Johnsons that uh, this was their last Christmas in the, uh, in the 
White House and maybe they would like to spend it in the White House instead of going back to the ranch, which they did. And they had several uh, parties where staff members and their children were invited in. I say several because they didn't want to get too many people at one party. Um, but anyway, the, uh, uh, the night that I remember, uh, we had two sons, Dan and Lyndon. Lyndon was 10 and Dan must have been 11 or 12 um, in 68. No, wait a second. Lyndon was 8, so Dan would have been 10 or maybe 9. No, just, just 10. Never mind. Don't get lost in all the arithmetic. Uh, he was a little boy, and Johnson was this towering presence of a man, you know, just dominated the room for the staff, you know. It didn't really, I don't think it mattered how well you knew him. Just, you couldn't help but, but be a little bit intimidated just by his very presence. And, uh, I have no idea who the president was talking to. Doesn't make any difference for the purposes of this story. Danny, who was all dressed up in his nice little neat uh, blue blazer and, and dark uh, flannel pants uh, and a little necktie and, and his hair brushed and everything, and he comes over and he pulls, it, quite literally pulls at the president's coat sleeve. And uh, the president was busy in this conversation, he turns down, he sees this little kid, and he says, just a minute. And he turns back and keeps on with his conversation. A couple more minutes go by, and uh, Danny tugs again. And the president looks down, and he says, well, I asked you to wait a minute. And a little bit gruff, you know. Uh, so another minute goes by, Danny pulls again. The president turns back to him and, and he says, Merry Christmas, Mr. President. And the expression on Johnson's face was just wonderful. He just beamed and he knelt down, talked to Danny for a couple of minutes. It was so touching. It was just uh, <clears throat> a memory that I'll always have. Tyler. Going back to that that evening in in uh, sixty, LBJ always said publicly, at least, that um, he never really wanted to run for president and never thought he was going to win, but uh, that uh, he felt that Kennedy needed needed the competition. What is that? Just his way of rewriting history? Did he really want the want the nomination? Do you think you could get it? Bobby Baker said it all. When, when Johnson accepted the uh, vice presidential nomination, and so many Texans had been opposed to running on the ticket, uh, Bobby said, uh, I was very near him to this announcement came across, and Bobby said, well, he's the most complicated man I ever knew. And I think that says it all, but I, I, I don't feel that there's any question that Johnson wanted to be president. Um, and Horace Busby told me that, uh, that years ago, years before, he had told Johnson that, uh, that Johnson would be, become president by being vice president. Now Horace was a very bright guy and he could quite easily have have figured the scenario where a Southerner was not going to be nominated. Uh, the, uh, that's the way the Democratic Party was divided up. They had so Southerners as vice presidents, Garner, Sparkman and uh, ran with Adlai Stevenson, uh, Keith Oliver ran with Adlai Stevenson, uh, but I don't think the uh, Democratic Party uh, was prepared to nominate a Southerner. Uh, so I, I assume that that's what Busby had, had thought through. But certainly his prescience about that was, was truly remarkable. 
Um, whether whether Johnson believed that he really had the votes that uh, his staff was saying he had, I don't know. I don't think he did. But I think he felt that, you know, you had to say that. His speech uh, at the convention when he um, uh, announced, and he didn't announce until just before the, the convention when he got to Los Angeles, it was about three or four days before, at the most, maybe, maybe just the day before. I remember the line that he had that uh, he said, uh, I, I think you ought to have a president with just a little more gray in his hair. Um, which was a line that uh, his friend, the uh, 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 Bill White, had written that speech for him. It's an excellent speech, really a good speech. Uh, and I thought that was a great line. Didn't carry enough weight to get him the nomination. Uh, I remember another occasion earlier that same year uh, when they uh, first opened the uh, LBJ for president uh, office in Washington. It was at the, uh, the hotel there on the corner of 14th and K, uh, belonged to K. Fritz. Um, all of a sudden, I got a blank about the name of the hotel, but it was, uh, it's been torn down and long since had a swimming pool in the basement. And we had the, uh, the mezzanine floor. Uh, maybe it was called Citizens for LBJ or something like that. Anyway, the, uh, John Connolly was one of the people that had pulled that together. And, uh, ran in the space and put up the sign and got a bunch of people there. And, uh, we were all, you know, trying to act like we were collecting delegates. And, you know, we were. We talked to delegates and those were the days before primaries. There were only a handful of primaries. West Virginia, Florida, uh, Wisconsin, I don't know, California. Uh, maybe three other states, not uh, New Hampshire, of course. Um, but the, the the majority of the delegates were either w w went through the convention process, and uh, and a lot of them, you know, had the option of, you know, voting for whoever they wanted to vote for, and many of them was whoever the governor told them to vote for. Anyway. Uh, Senator Johnson, John Connolly, Earl Clements, Bobby Baker, and I uh, had a breakfast at the Mayflower Hotel. And uh, it was, uh, you know, to talk about, you know, how we were going to get, get more votes. Um, and Johnson was in a little bit of a grumpy mood. Uh, and the, the scene that I remember, I remember a couple of scenes there. One was that the, the waiters were so anxious to both listen and please us that they kept spilling coffee all over the table. They, if you take a sip of coffee, they'd immediately come and fill it up and that would spill into the saucer and then they'd take that away and it would spill on the table to the point where the head waiter finally came over and told them to get the heck out of there. Uh, and then uh, we got in the car. I had driven there, and uh, when we left, they said, well, we'll give you a, you know, come on up with us. And, and so anyway, I went in the senator's limousine, and, and I think all of us went together. And uh, Johnson was uh, berating John Connolly about spending too much money. 
I said, how much money are you spending down there anyway? And uh, Connolly, of course, didn't want to tell and figured that there was no value in carrying on this kind of a conversation, but Johnson wasn't going to let it go. That Kennedy would, uh, Connolly would try to steer the conversation over to something else. And Johnson said, well, I know what's going to happen. He said, you're going to tell me that if I meet so-and-so and stick my nose four feet up his ass and he's going to give us $50,000 to pay for all this. Well, I just think you ought to stop spending all that money. Um, and I, th you know, my thought was, well, you know, that's the way politics works, but sure is a graphic way to state it. <laughs> Things were a lot looser in those days, but we didn't spend nearly the amount of money that's spent now. It's just incredible. Incredible. We just spent, I mean, you know, just pocket money, really. I was making something like $50 a week. And um, when, we, uh, when we flew out to the convention, we flew in an unmarked plane that I found out from the pilot belonged to Brown and Root. I just piled all the campaign workers in a Brown and Root plane and flew them out to Los Angeles. Nobody had a word to say about it. It was a DC-3. Um, I, that's, uh, that's my repertoire for now. It's very good. Uh, really. Fascinating. Thank you. You're a great guy to remember. I do it all the time. I'll get you the drink of water. Would you like me to go get sandwiches? No, I have. I asked Gladys to make some ham sandwiches. Okay. Oh, you there. yep. <laughs> Everyone forgets that. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to be here and, and not have to think that there's a camera or all that other kind of stuff. Okay. Great. Let's see, I guess it goes around. Anybody see Dick Murphy at all? I haven't seen Murph in a while, and our uh, little post office group, well, you know, because yeah. I think you've been invited to a couple yeah. of our uh, meetings and reunions. Um, one day in 1964, it was probably in the spring, but it doesn't make any difference. Uh, I got a call at home from Walter Jenkins, who said he wanted to see me. Walter Jenkins was, of course, uh, the most trusted of all of the president's confidants, and, uh, and a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, so uh, naturally, I, if Walter Jenkins wanted to see me, I'd do anything, uh, so uh, I suggested because I knew he lived not too far from where I lived. I said, well, if you want, I'll, uh, you know, I'll come over there now, or if you want to see me in the morning? He said, yeah, we'll meet in the morning. I said, well, would you like me to pick you up and take you to work? He said, sure. So I drove over to his house, and um, we headed for the White House uh, with me driving a little Volkswagen. And uh, which actually I had given to my wife uh, the year before, two years before. But she now had a White House car to drive her around. So uh, the Volkswagen got traded around and, and used by other members of the family. 
And Walter uh, said, Tyler, he said, uh, there's uh, something rather disturbing I have to tell you about. He said, a car registered in your name has been seen outside the Russian embassy. And uh, I said, well, it's probably this car. He said, yeah. He said, uh, this, this fits the description. I said, well, I can explain that. Uh, you know, I loaned this car to my mother and stepfather because it's really my wife's car and uh, she doesn't use it very much, so uh, uh, they use it. And, uh, and I know that my stepfather has a good relationship with the Russian ambassador, so clearly, you know, that's why it's been parked in front of the Russian embassy. He said, well, okay, that's a, that's a good explanation, and, and we accept that, but he says, I, I think you better tell your stepfather not to park in front of the Russian embassy anymore. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, that did exactly that. And years later, it was 1970, I was at a uh, fundraising party in New Jersey for Pete Williams, a senator from New Jersey. And uh, one of the, you know, it was a cast of hundreds at least, and one of the people there was a congressman named Neil Gallagher. And Neil Gallagher had gotten into a certain amount of trouble. I can't remember now what it was, but I, I think he might have been indicted and possibly convicted. And, and uh, who knows how long that had been going on. But Neil and I were uh, uh, not really friends. And I was, in fact, kind of surprised that he knew who I was. And uh, anyway, we struck up a conversation as as which is the type of thing, of course, that's supposed to happen at those parties. And uh, he said, you know, Tyler, uh, I know about your problems with the FBI. Well, I didn't really have a problem with the FBI. And then he said, uh, said the president told me uh, that the FBI had seen your car parked in front of the Russian embassy, and I know that you got in a lot of trouble because of that. And I said, yeah, wow, that's, that's true. I said, and, and I've forgotten what else we had to say, but you know, we created stories and so forth for a while. But what struck me, and the point of this story, is you know, how detailed President Johnson was. That it wasn't just that Deke DeLoach from the FBI had called Walter Jenkins and told him about my car being in front of the Russian embassy but that Walter had passed it on to the president, obviously, and the president had remembered it. Not only remembered it, but when a congressman, whose vote he probably wanted for something, uh, he was knowledgeable enough, the president was, to know that Neil Gallagher was in trouble with the FBI and to put him at ease by telling them about me. This guy, Johnson, was just remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Um, another story that uh, comes to mind is not quite in the same uh, magnitude, but uh, does ex again tell something about a man who never lost an opportunity to do something. Um, it was probably three or four days after he became president. He still hadn't moved into the White House. Um, he was occupying the Oval Office, of course. That happened the very next day after uh, he arrived back in, in Washington from uh, Dallas. But uh, Mrs. Kennedy was still occupying the living quarters. So, uh, and my wife was the, not just the social secretary, she was the person that took care of the Elms where he, uh, a home that he purchased uh, after he became vice president. Um, so she ran everything at the Elms, so fixed the pool, did the pipes, uh, called the electrician, 
Um, took complaints from uh, the vice president when he didn't like the heat of the pool or the uh, or what was served for dinner or whatever else it was. And so on this occasion, uh, there was a small dinner party, and I, th the the people that I can remember for sure that were there were Bess and myself, the president and Mrs. Johnson, my stepfather and my mother. Um, and I, I think possibly that, uh, that Arthur Goldberg was there. Um, anyway, it was, you know, it was, it was an interesting, eclectic guest list. Um, and at one point during the conversation, uh, the president made a reference to me. I was then working as a special assistant to the Postmaster General. And uh, he said uh, something to me about uh, the fact that the, the uh, newspaper publishers and the, and the catalog people got these huge mail subsidies. And I said, uh, yes, Mr. President, uh, but the, uh, the real mail subsidy that you could put an end to pretty quickly is what we pay the railroads. Uh, we're subsidizing them to the amount of $400 million a year. And uh, you could put an end to that pretty quickly if you wanted to. And uh, nothing more was said about it. But the next morning, I got a call, bright and early. Uh, and, uh, you know, would like a memo about that, which I prepared obviously expeditiously and sent it over there. And uh, the uh, years later, uh, you know, a couple of years later, I was <laughs> then had been promoted to assistant postmaster general. I got a call from Walter Jenkins, <clears throat> and Walter said, "My uh, friends on the Katy Railroad uh, are, are worried that." you're going to take a mail contract away from them. I had nothing to do with the mail contracts. That was a whole other division of the post office called the Division of Transportation. And I said, well, you know, Walter, the <laughs> that's one of the, the first things that the President and I ever spoke about. And probably the only thing we ever spoke about concerning the post office department was the subsidy for the railroads. And he said, well, if you, if it if it shouldn't be done, don't worry about it. But if uh, if you can stop it uh, and it's the right thing to do, you know, just you know, let me know. So I did check into it and and let him know that uh, <clears throat> we were going to stop the mail on the Katy Railroad. But Walter wasn't about to. Uh, tell me or anybody else to do something that wasn't the right thing to do. And we all knew that, uh, that the president was omnipotent. It was just phenomenal. He kept track of everything all the time. And uh, he wouldn't argue with me about the mail subsidies because he was prepared to believe that, that I understood what I was talking about. Uh, but he just didn't wanted it done right. <clears throat> Do you have a summary about Bobby Kennedy? Um, yes, that's. Uh, I don't think there was any way that LBJ got involved in that. Uh, but it's an interesting story of that era. Uh, Just because the only way, that, I don't know that he got involved in it, but when I was asking him about it and what you could do about it, he said that I only have one friend in the White House. Fortunately, his name is Jack Kennedy. Yeah. This was when. Uh, uh, when LBJ was, was vice president. 
and I was working as a special assistant to uh, uh, the Postmaster General, a wonderful, wonderful man named J. Edward Day. And uh, Mr. Day called me in one uh, day to his office and said that uh, he'd gotten a call from Bobby Kennedy uh, that, and Bobby had, <coughs> had told him that uh, Michael Monroney, who was another assistant, in fact was Mr. Day's executive assistant, uh, and I should both be fired because we were disloyal to the administration and we weren't doing the things that, uh, uh, that he wanted done over here. And uh, I knew what it uh, what had evolved because a Justice Department employee named Paul Corbin, uh, who was a, uh, a maniac, quite literally, and uh, but who worked for Bobby and who was always throwing Bobby's name around, had <coughs> told me that uh, that Bobby wanted certain contracts changed in upstate New York and that the people who had the contracts uh, shouldn't have them and that we ought to cancel them and give these contracts over to somebody else. And uh, he made, Corbin made the allegation that these guys were crooks and, uh, you know, they were in with the mafia and so forth and so forth. Uh, and I had investigated it uh, carefully, and I couldn't find any reason that, that we could come up with to do Bobby Kennedy's bidding, and I just told uh, Paul Corbin that we couldn't. So Corbin, in turn, of course, had, uh, you know, had to play his trump card and tell Bobby that, uh, that we were bad guys and get us fired, which uh, Ed Day, to his credit, wouldn't do. And uh, I told Bess this story, and uh, she re recited to me the uh, what the president or then vice president told her, which is, uh, I only have one friend in the White House. Fortunately, it's Jack Kennedy. Uh, I guess being vice president was a very difficult period for Johnson. Uh, the times that I saw him I, <clears throat> during that period, I, I don't think I ever saw any indication of, of the unhappiness that I frequently read about. Um, there were happy times and, and, and good times going on, and I guess the frustrations of the job were you know, the, the kind of thing that made Thomas Jefferson call it the greatest job in the world and made John Ance Garner call it the job that was worth no more than a bucket of warm spit. But uh, I do remember a time when uh, the president came to the vice president's house. It was, after, it was on the uh, one year anniversary of uh, of his uh, inaugural, and they'd had a big uh, uh, party at the uh, uh, the armory, and the uh, the singers and dancers and entertainers <coughs> who had been at the inaugural uh, party uh, the in, on in 1961 basically put on a similar show in 1962. And then afterwards, uh, the vice president had them out to his house, the Elms, uh, for an after the show uh, mixer and uh, food. And anytime you went to something that the Johnsons did, they were, that was first class. I mean, you got food and drink and uh, of the very best kind. and, and uh, so we were all having a good time, and the uh, uh, the president and Mrs. Kennedy showed up, and uh, they suggested that uh, the entertainers do some more entertaining, 
which they did, and it was it was wonderful. It was great fun and entertaining. We were all sitting on the on chairs and around on the floor and and uh, in the uh, big room at the Elms. Uh, and uh, Gene Kelly got up and said, uh, "Now, Mr. Vice President," he says, "I want you to come up here with me." And Mr. Johnson started to get up and, and sort of moved over to uh, be with, uh, with Gene Kelly. He said, uh, Gene Kelly said, we're going to sing a song. And at that, <laughs> the vice president, he knew he was good at an awful lot of things, but he was not a singer. So he uh, just sort of slunk back into the crowd and Kelly tried to drag him up and he said, no, no, he wasn't going to get up there. So then the president got up and uh, Gene Kelly and the president sang, When Irish Eyes Are Smiling, which, uh, and that was sort of the denouement of the party. Great. Had you, t you know, I, I'm sure you're going to drop a bunch of these, but uh, these little things keep coming back to me and they, they all tell me stories about, they're, they're stories about LBJ, they're funny in some respects. Uh, most of them have their humorous side. Uh, but they all, they all tell to me a story of a guy who thought that he could do everything. And in many respects, he was right. Um, but he recognized, as a, the story I just told about singing, there were certain things that he, he couldn't do. Um, but in terms of taking charge, yes, he could take charge of everything. Uh, it was a hot summer day, I mean, really hot. And uh, we were, Bess and I were invited to come over to the Johnsons to swim. And when we arrived, uh, uh, Vice President Johnson was in his pool in a, one of these styrofoam chairs that you could sort of sit in the chair and, and have a drink in the, in the cubby ho cup holder and uh, paddle around. He was in there and is uh, paddling around a little bit, sitting, relaxing, and, and it, was, it was a l little bit like, you know, what he'd love to do was to command the room and, you know, be in charge of things. And, and sitting on the, this chair in the pool, you know, surrounded by, by water, it was, you know, a little bit like the king that wanted to tell the waves to get away. Um, and, and he had his glasses on, which, you know, most people don't wear glasses in the pool. And he said, well, I can't see without the... And he gave us a big welcome as we came through the house and came down through the terrace and down to the pool. And he said, I'm just in here paddling around. He said, just enjoying my life. He says, I've got to wear my glasses in here because otherwise I can't see a thing. Um, and anyway, we went on and swam and talked, <clears throat> enjoyed life. And as the as the day uh, kind of dragged on, he realized there were some things that he wanted to get done. So he called, got on the phone. Of course, there are phones everywhere. And he got on the phone and called Warren Woodward, who was a uh, I don't know whether Woody was still working for him or. I think Woody was probably at that point working for uh, the, uh, the TV station in, in Austin, but maybe he was on the staff in Austin or maybe he was off on his own doing something private. It didn't make any difference. It was s Saturday evening and so I'm sure he called Woody at home. He said, Woody, I need some bass. He said, we got this pool but we don't have enough, uh, you know, we got guests coming in all the time and I need some bathing suits for these people that, that come here without their bathing suits. I want you to order some bathing suits. He said, we need this size, this size, this size, and this size, and maybe we ought to get three or four of this size. And it's just, you know, it's just fascinating. The guy couldn't sit still for a minute. Uh, he had to, to get something done. He had to accomplish something. And. Uh, the frustrations that he must have gone through with the war in Vietnam just uh, boggle the mind. I, I never was in, involved in, a, in you know, one scintilla of that. 
but uh, I certainly knew his personality and how he, you know, he relied on the people around him when he had to for the, you know, the extra things that he wanted that he couldn't reach out that far, but he, he wanted to be sure he controlled them. And to now have the McNamara's of the world coming in and, and second-guessing them on the war in Vietnam after they told him what to do, uh, he must be rotating in his grave. I was uh, talking to uh, his uh, niece's uh, husband one day, uh, Donald MacArthur, a wonderful guy. And uh, the president had appointed him as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, Research and Development. A very bright scientist. I say he was a bright scientist. He was bright. I don't know enough about science to know how bright a scientist he was, but he must have been pretty good. Anyway, uh, he and I got talking about the war in Vietnam, and, and uh, Donald said, you know, it's, it's hopeless. You know, there's no way we're going to win this war. And knowing what I know about the president, I said, well, you know, he's going to respect you, Donald, because, you know, you're there in the Pentagon with all the details. Uh, what happens when you tell him about that? He says, he didn't want to listen. He said, he didn't want to listen? I said, no. He said, Donald said, no. He just, you know, I've raised it with him a couple of times, and, and he just doesn't want to listen. There's, uh, he's in a impossible situation, and uh, he's not interested in what I have to say.